This is the story of Sir James Dyson, the man who failed 5,126 times before he finally came up with that one invention that would turn his life around. The G-Force Vacuum Cleaner One of the most famous examples we give to inspire ourselves to strive for our goals is Thomas Edison's 9,999 failures before inventing the light bulb. However, you may not know the dramatic story of Sir James Dyson, a more modern inventor who relegates Thomas Edison's failure story to a second position. The story of James Dyson is one of how learning from failures forms a core foundation of success instead of rejecting it. We at Business Chronicles tell the stories of extraordinarily successful people. Please subscribe to our channel to help us in making more videos. The entire life of James Dyson has been about crossing boundaries. This is most evident in his inventions which span across a multi-layered cross-section of devices. From reinventing and creating relevant home devices such as the ball barrow, the bagless vacuum cleaner, the air dryer, and the bladeless fan, to military inventions such as the wheelboat and the sea truck, and finally to an attempt in creating an electric vehicle. Perhaps what is more incredible than Dyson's inventions and world-recognized achievements is the story behind each invention and the journey leading to the empire he has created today. When you consider the extent and ingenuity of Dyson's work, you would almost begin to wonder if he was born with two brains or some special power. James Dyson, named after his grandfather, was born on 2nd May 1947. Contrary to the idea of him having some magical powers at birth, he was born an ordinary child to his parents, Alec and Mary Dyson. He grew up in Cromer, Norfolk, England. Cromer was a small town characterized by dunes and marshes. Dyson lived a quiet yet exciting life with his parents and two siblings, Alexander and Tom. His childhood was littered with a lot of activity in typical countryside living at the time. These included sailing, picnicking, and cranking his father's car any time they had to drive to the beach, an activity which fast became a subject for giggles for him and his two brothers. Whether out of the need to stay healthy or pure excitement, Dyson would run up and down these dunes which were pretty high then. Without realizing it, he would easily do 10 miles of running before coming to a stop. At this time in his young life, he discovered a passion for long-distance running a sport from which he took one major lesson, determination. Dyson had no idea at the time how much of that he would need and how incredibly beneficial that lesson would be to him later in his life. While recalling his childhood, Dyson said, Running taught me about determination, about not giving up, and particularly not giving up when everything seems hopeless, and everything is against you, and everything is against you, and everything is difficult. That's the time you must double down. As they say, really go for it because success or the end is just around the corner. Seeing the end around the corner was a critical perspective that helped Dyson achieve some of the breakthroughs he has to his credit today. But there was an end he had not anticipated that would shatter his heart and almost truncate his budding growth as a promising young man. The unanticipated end was his father's death. How could he have perceived such an end? He was only nine at the time. Dyson's relationship with his father was a unique one. His father, Alec Dyson, also doubled as his teacher at Gresham School, where James had his formative education. His father taught classics in school, but had been an army man. He prided himself as a man who did not let himself be restricted by any form of limitation. Not even the throat and lung cancer that plagued him most of his life. The throat cancer impaired his ability to speak, but he would still go to class and with the help of a hailer of some sort, teach full lessons. Considering how much James Dyson reflected this form of tenacity, you cannot help but wonder if tenacity is a genetic trait. Alec Dyson held on to the principles of education and made sure to pass those principles on to his sons as well. Once during a classics lesson, Alec Dyson found his son James sleeping. His reaction was priceless. He threw a blackboard rubber at him and successfully achieved his aim of it landing on his head. James Dyson was rudely awakened. He never slept in his dad's class or any other class after that experience. It must have taught him a good lesson for life. After losing his father to cancer, Dyson and his two brothers, Alexander and Tom, were left with no form of security for their future. They had no money to continue their schooling. 
At that time, the headmaster of Gresham's, Lodgy Bruce Lockhart, offered to let them continue their education and stay at the school free of charge. It was an incredible investment for which Dyson would later reward the school in his days of success. Even with that support, the only thing that was certain about Dyson's future at the time was his sportsmanship. Apart from that, the only faint dream he thought he should pursue was a low-pulsing desire to become a surgeon. However, once in a conversation with the career masters at the Gresham School, the master said to him, I think you should be an estate agent. Dyson, looking for any form of direction to hold on to, agreed and went to see an estate agent in Cambridge to pursue that venture. The estate agent saw Dyson and thought he should rather be an artist. At this point, Dyson was at a crossroads. He eventually settled for his dream of becoming a surgeon. He sought an interview at St. George's Hospital to that effect. While at the hospital, the doctor there saw him and told him, you should be an artist. Having been told to become an artist by two people, Dyson gave up on his dream of becoming a surgeon and made a decision to pursue art. Following his time at Gresham's, James was accepted into and completed his studies at the Byam Shaw School of Art. He studied from 1965 to 1966 before moving on to the Royal College of Art to pursue architectural design, where he spent four years from 1966 to 1970. It was about the same period that he met Deirdre Hinmarsh, who would go on to become his future wife and biggest fan and supporter. Also, during this time of his life, he developed a lifelong fascination with functional design and engineering, thanks to his encounter with his mentor, Jeremy Fry. At the Royal College of Art, James Dyson would find himself once again on the path of what was starting to become a pattern in his life. The suggestion and direction of people around him to do something he had otherwise never thought of or had experience in. The story is told of how he developed a one-of-a-kind design for a mushroom-shaped theatre building for Joan Littlewood in Stratford in East London. Upon completing the design, he set off to the office of the chairman of an engineering company, Jeremy Fry, to pitch his design. James's goal was to get Fry to help him finance the project. Fry briefly looked at the design, looked up at James and said, Well, that's very nice, but I am not going to give you any money for it. Before James could express his disappointment, Fry, who doubled as a British inventor and engineer, told James, But I would like you to design a landing craft for me. This craft is what would later be known as the sea truck, much like the rude awakening he received when his father threw a blackboard rubber at his head. James had to wake from his comfort of art and enter the world of innovation and engineering, which he previously knew nothing about. The combination of these two parallel yet powerful subjects would later come together to form a profound philosophy Sir Dyson would employ in reconstructing the face of science in the world. James was absolutely ignorant of what it took to manifest such an idea, but he had one thing, the determination he had built from his youthful days in Norfolk to surmount any challenge he found before him. James became Fry's protege and practically learned on the job. He eventually succeeded in building the sea truck, which could serve multiple functions as a landing craft, a diving boat, a bridging tug, and even as a fast assault craft. Now, after James graduated from the Royal College of Art in 1970, still without any proper experience, Fry invited him to lead the new marine division of the company Rotork, which Fry founded. James accepted the offer, trusting Jeremy's guidance. The development, manufacturing, and selling of the sea truck from his position at Rotork would build a unique sense of resilience and tenacity in Dyson. These traits would later serve him well when he finally decided to start a business of his own. He gave me my first job and taught me what works, James said of Fry during an interview with the Financial Times. This move of going at it on his own occurred in 1974. The budding engineer was ultimately enticed away from the offer of conventional job security and convenience by his concept for an innovative creation. A plastic barrow with a ball rather than a wheel. The ball barrow was an innovative solution that challenged the status quo of conventional wheelbarrows and improved several aspects. Instead of a thin wheel, it had the world's first load-spreading pneumatic ball, which combined with its wide legs kept it from sinking into soft ground. This innovation was a world's first, but was only one of many to come. 
Sir James Dyson had grown from a surgeon wannabe to a designer to an engineer and now an inventor. All of his growth was in addition to his responsibility of being a husband to Deirdre and a father to his three children, Sam, Jacob and Emily. Despite the additional pressure of family life, James continued to create by himself, developing various innovative devices such as the wheelboat. However, James could not commercialize the project to the public since it was believed to have significant value for the military. Some four years down the line, 1978 marked the year when he had one of the most significant turning points in his life as an inventor. Once while he was spraying powdered paint onto the metal frames of the ball barrow, he became annoyed by the way that excess powder would miss the frames and instead get trapped in the calico cloth that was behind the wheelbarrow, causing it to become clogged. James decided to pay attention and discover a new and better way to fix the problem. He had been impressed by an expensive industrial cyclone that he had seen at a nearby timber mill, so he decided to manufacture a version of it in an attempt to solve the ball barrow's clog issue. As a result, he built a 25-foot cyclone to remove the waste powder from the facility. He would later refer to this as a sort of filter that never clogged and it was absolutely efficient. Coincidentally, an identical issue surfaced in the Dyson family home at about the same time. After purchasing a top-of-the-line Hoover vacuum cleaner, James was disappointed to learn that the non-reusable bag frequently became stuck with dust and grime. James quickly cultivated the curiosity to learn if the technology he had installed in the ball barrow factory could also be applied to vacuum cleaners. So he fashioned a crude cyclone out of cardboard and attached it to his upright vacuum cleaner in place of the bag. It turned out to be a game changer. Sir James Dyson would go on to spend four years perfecting this technology. During those four years, he, his wife, and his kids lived on the salary his wife brought home from her teaching job. James failed at making his invention work 5,126 times, but he would not give up after all that sacrifice and conviction he had poured in. In the fourth year, the first cyclonic vacuum cleaner was finally ready for production at the 5,127th prototype. However, like cold water was thrown on a rising furnace, no manufacturer was willing to take a chance on it at the time. At the time, the market for vacuum cleaner bags in Europe alone was worth over $500 million. Yet, all of the major vacuum manufacturers turned down James's proposal for a cyclonic vacuum. This was partly because nobody wanted to disturb the already booming market for replacement cleaner bags in the UK. James Dyson had difficulty selling his innovative design to a manufacturer or distributor outside or within the United Kingdom. Dyson, unrestricted by boundaries and challenges, changed the field of play and launched his product in Japan. The G-Force vacuum cleaner, as it was called, began to thrive in this unexpected territory. A few years later, the G-Force vacuum cleaner would relaunch in the UK with the help of an excellent advertising campaign on television dubbed Say Goodbye to the Bag. Dyson had officially taken on a new identity. He was now a successful businessman. Quite interestingly, Dyson's new vacuum cleaner overtook the sales of the same manufacturers who had refused to market his product. Some of them, including Hoover UK, even tried to copy his design. Dyson was having none of it. He sued the company and ended up with a win and a $5 million payment in damages. Springing from his growing desire for invention and the need to fix practical problems around him, Dyson and a growing team of scientists and engineers would proceed to spew even more inventions. One of their most significant inventions was the bladeless fan, which was recorded as the first significant innovation in fans in more than 125 years. Other products included low-energy cordless vacuums, high-efficiency hair dryers, and even an attempt at an electric car. Today, Dyson has transcended various identities to emerge as more than one man. To mention Dyson is to mention a brand and a global technology company that is present in 84 markets and growing. Again, another fascinating thing about Sir James Dyson is his ability to take his experiences and use them to better his world. He has supported and invested in the health industry by building the Dyson Cancer Center at the Royal United Hospital's Bath. You don't have to guess too far to wonder where that inspiration came from. 
His time with Mr. Jeremy Fry also cultivated in him the spirit of mentorship and the provision of opportunities for others to explore their creativity. It is no wonder that Sir James Dyson strongly advocates and encourages many of the youth to bring their creativity to bear and explore new ground. And to put his money where his mouth is, he built the Dyson Institute of Engineering and Technology. He also established the James Dyson Foundation to support and provide a platform for young people who desire to explore the engineering and science space. Undergraduate students enrolled in the Dyson Institute of Engineering and Technology do not pay for any tuition and also receive salaries while studying there. Again, one remarkable thing that makes Sir James Dyson stand out is his ability to approach engineering from a design perspective. He focuses not just on function but also on beauty and things that make the heart grow fonder of his creations. This unique combination has allowed him to appreciate the intersection where engineering and art meet. You could say that his unique set of skills and experiences put him ahead of his time. Before companies like Amazon, Apple and Facebook could catch on to the wave of the importance of design and concept in product creation, James Dyson had already reached the shore in that department. And now more than ever, combining these unique perspectives and his philosophy of the need to fail forward. He advocates this harmony in his work and establishments, opening up new possibilities for the world of science, engineering, and innovation. As a result of his life's work and accomplishments, he has been acknowledged on various fronts. He was awarded the CBE in 1996 and received the Prince Philip Designers Prize a year later. He was also awarded the Knight Bachelor in 2007. Among his most prominent acknowledgments was his appointment to the Order of Merit in the 2016 New Year Honors. This appointment is the Queen's only personal gift and the highest honor there is. And there are only to mention but a few of his plethora of national accolades. The story of Sir James Dyson as an inventor and the sum of his experiences present him as more of a metaphorical farmer. This is because of his ability to find seeds in both the device and people around him and nurture them to fruitlessness so that they begin to matter in the most unique way. James Dyson's transition into a man transcending various fields of relevance is his most notable feat. His work today is found and acknowledged in various areas such as health, academics, politics, business, and more especially in the very daily lives of people. His life's work and experiences teach the art of resilience, teachability, patience, and the importance of a heart of service. He summarizes the most important lesson you can learn from his life in his book, Invention, A Life. Enjoy failure and learn from it. You never learn from success, Dyson writes in the book. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel to watch more videos like